Welcome to the One God Report podcast. This is podcast number 122. I'm Bill Schlegel. The title of this podcast is Isaiah 53. Who is the suffering servant? The main point being, the suffering servant is not God. This podcast will have two, yay, verily, maybe three main points. The first point is... As the title states, whoever the suffering servant is, in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant is someone other than God, someone other than yud He vav He. The suffering servant is not God. And then secondly, we'll look at some of the candidates for who the suffering servant is. Is it Israel, as most of rabbinical Judaism has understood, or is it specifically Jesus, the Messiah, who came in the first century. We'll see that all of the candidates, no matter who you think the candidate is, none of them are God. And this is probably one of the reasons I got interested in doing this podcast. There are a lot of Isaiah chapter 53 videos on YouTube and sermons from a person like Dr. Michael Brown. He's debated with uh, Rabbi Shmuley Boteach, or he's debated with uh, Rabbi Tovia Singer on who is Isaiah 53 talking about. And Dr. Brown is adamant that it's all about Jesus only. And usually the rabbis say, no, it's about Israel. Back and forth, back and forth. In some ways, I would say they're both right, but they're both wrong. Whoever the candidate is, I think we can see that that suffering servant that Isaiah is talking about is a prototype for the Messiah. Israel is a prototype for the Messiah. The Messiah is part of Israel and represents Israel. So we'll talk about who potential candidates are, but it's very clear from the book of Isaiah and from the quotes of Isaiah in the New Testament about Jesus that the suffering servant is somebody distinct from God. And this is one problem I have with the Messianics that want to point people to Isaiah 53 and say, hey, see, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. It's kind of a bait and switch. Because yes, I think that Isaiah is foreseeing the coming of the Messiah, the human person, Jesus Christ. He's the Messiah, the servant of the Lord. Not the Lord, but the servant of the Lord. He's an anointed one. But that's something very different. That's not really what the Messianics care about. The main thing the Messianic thrust is, the quote-unquote Christian Messianics, is that Jesus is God. It's secondary that he's the Messiah. The main point, the main thrust, is that he's God. If you don't think that Jesus is God, then you're a heretic, whatever, you're damned for eternity, all these kinds of things that they'll say. I can insist all day long till I'm blue in the face that I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. I do believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But to the Messianic Trinitarian deity of Christ believer, I'm a heretic. They don't really care if I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. To them, I must believe that Jesus is literally God. So it's a bait and switch to say, oh, yeah, see, He's the Messiah. He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. Okay, it is. But it's not saying that Jesus is God. It's not saying that the suffering servant is God. Don't be deceptive. If you think that Isaiah chapter 53 is talking about an incarnate God, show that. Don't just talk about him being Messiah, Messiah, Messiah. And none of this double speak about this being the man, Jesus, or something like that. But really, he's a God or he's a God-man. There's nothing about a God-man in Isaiah 53. It's only in the imagination of people that Jesus is somehow a second God figure that's taken on or become flesh. So let's get this straight. The suffering servant of Isaiah chapter 53 is not God. Let's look at a few verses in this section of Isaiah which show that the servant is not God. If you've heard about this at all, You know that many times in the book of Isaiah, Israel is called the servant of God. You are my servant, Israel. You are my servant, Jacob, in whom I will be glorified. 
Yahweh has redeemed his servant, Jacob. You are my servant, Israel. You are my servant, Jacob. Clearly, the people of Israel are not God. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13. Whoever this servant is, behold, my servant shall prosper. Now, who is speaking? Yes, this is God. This is yud he vav -Heh, the personal name of God, the God of Israel speaking. He calls this person my servant. The person speaking, yud he vav -Heh, speaking, saying my, it's preposterous to think that when I say something like, this is my wife, that my wife is me. My wife is somebody else, a different being, a different person than I am. Or, this is my son. I am separating myself. I'm distinguishing myself from my son. So when Yudhe Vavhe says, this is my servant, the servant is somebody other than God, Yudhe Vavhe. So any of the phrases where God says, this is my servant, we can understand that the servant is not God himself. The servant is God's servant. Two different beings, two different persons. You can use whatever language you want. The servant is distinguished from God because the servant is God's servant. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4. The people speaking say, We esteemed him smitten by God. Okay? The servant is somebody distinct from God who is suffering, they thought, because God put this pain on him. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6 declares that yud he vav -He has caused to come on him the iniquity of us all. So here is yud he vav -He, this is a very interesting verb, who's caused to touch or caused to come upon him the iniquity of us all. Again, look at this passage. Yahweh is the subject of the verb in that sentence, but he is not the object of the verb in the sentence. Yahweh is acting upon someone else. He's not acting upon himself. He's acting upon someone other than Yudhei Vavhe, Yahweh God. Next, Pat. Just keep going right through this passage. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 through 9. Yudhei Vavhe, God, is not a lamb. Just like in the book of Revelation, the Lamb is not God, and God is not the Lamb. The Lamb is someone else other than God. Yudhe Vavhe is not cut off from the land who dies. Yudhe Vavhe does not die. So this servant is someone other than Yudhe Vavhe, the God of Israel. Next verse, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10, states this. It was the will of Yudhe Vavhe to bruise him. Again, the subject of the verb is Yudhevave. The object of the verb is him. The him is somebody else other than Yudhevave. Yudhevave is doing an action, and the servant receives the action of the verb. The verse continues. If his soul makes a guilt offering, he will see his offspring... The will of Yudhevave will prosper in his hand. Yes, the will of Yudhevave, God, prospers in someone else's hand, in his hand, the servant's hand. So again, the servant is not Yudhevave. He's doing the will of Yudhevave. Next verse, Isaiah 53 11. Just read it. It's very, very clear. That in every situation, every case in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant is not God himself. It's somebody other than God. Isaiah 53, 11. By his knowledge, that is by the servant's knowledge, by his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, Yahweh speaking, give righteous judgment for many. Okay? So once again, the servant is Yahweh's servant. He's not Yahweh. Isaiah 53, 12. Yahweh speaking. Therefore, I 
will divide for him a portion among the mighty. Oh, so Yahweh will do something for this servant. He's going to divide him a portion among the mighty. And he, God is speaking, somebody else other than God, he will divide spoil with the strong. Because he, somebody other than you, Devave, poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Okay, can we all agree, Jewish people, Messianic Jews, Gentile Christians, that the servant of Isaiah chapter 53 is not yud heh vav -He God. The servant is somebody else other than God. So my beef is really with the Messianic Christians here. Don't come saying, well, this is Jesus. Don't, and don't come to Jewish people saying, oh, look at it, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. When really what you want to have them believe is that the suffering servant is literally God. It's very clear in this passage that the suffering servant is not God. The suffering servant is someone other than God. Now, if that's not clear enough in Isaiah's writing itself, then turn to the New Testament, and you can see how the apostles understood the relationship of Jesus, the servant of God, to the God of Israel. Look at the early preaching of the apostle Peter in Acts chapter 3 when he's speaking to the Jewish people. Peter says in Acts chapter 3 verse 13, The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. Okay? Can everybody see that in Peter's mind, Jesus is the servant of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? That is, Jesus himself is not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is someone other than the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Peter continues with this sermon. Acts chapter 3, verse 17. He's speaking to the Jewish people in Jerusalem. He says, I know, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ should suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he, God, may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. Jesus is somebody other than God. God foretold by the mouth of his prophets that his Christ should suffer. Somebody other than God himself. The Christ is not God. Acts chapter 3, same chapter, verse 26. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Okay, so God, somebody other than the servant, raised up his servant. So the servant is not God. God brought his servant into the world, and God sent him to the Jewish people first. The next chapter in the book of Acts, after Peter had been arrested and given his testimony, and he was released, and the disciples were gathered together, and they lift up their voices together to God. This is Acts 4.24. And here's what Peter prays. Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who by the mouth of David, your servant, David is a servant of Yahweh, did say by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth set themselves in array and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, that's Yudhevave, and against his anointed, his Messiah, two different beings. Verse 27, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus. So Peter is praying to the sovereign Lord who made heaven and earth, and he says, They have been gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you did anoint. So Jesus, the servant, is somebody other than the sovereign Lord who made heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. 
and he continues to pray. He says, Lord, look upon their threats, the threats of the leaders, and grant to your servants, calls himself a servant, to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Okay? Jesus is the servant of of the sovereign God who made heaven and earth. He is not the God who made heaven and earth. He is the servant of the God who made heaven and earth. Now, there are something like seven passages in the New Testament where the author directly quotes from Isaiah 53, besides the passages like I just read in Acts 3 and 4, where Peter is calling Jesus the servant of Yudhe For instance, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 17, Isaiah 53, 4 is quoted After Jesus was healing the sick and casting out demons, Matthew says, In this way, what was spoken by Isaiah the prophet was fulfilled. He took our weaknesses and carried our diseases. You can see that Matthew is not thinking in a substitutionary atonement way in this point. This is another issue entirely. Maybe I'll mention something about it, but that's not my main point here. The context that Matthew gives in that quote is Jesus healing people and casting out demons, that Jesus had the power to do it, that he took our weaknesses, he took them away, he had the power to do it. It's not a substitutionary, atonement, penal substitution kind of way. Jesus had the power and authority to remove or take away human suffering. But perhaps the the most significant passage that Isaiah 53 is quoted in the New Testament is in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 23 to 25. Let me read this. And again, we can see that the Isaiah 53 passage being applied to Jesus shows us that Jesus is not God. Yes, he's a servant of God. He's not God himself. Here's what Peter says. He's talking actually to servants in this context. If we back up to 1 Peter 2, verse 20, It's in the context, really, of speaking to servants. He says, servants, one is approved if, mindful of God, he endures pain while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it to you if you sin and are mistreated and endure it? But if you do good and suffer and so endure, this finds favor with God. For to this you were called, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example for you to follow in his steps. So this is the context of Peter's quoting of Isaiah 53, of Jesus being the servant of yud That is, that he suffered unjustly, and he, he put up with it. He didn't respond negatively. He didn't fight back. This is the context where now Peter is going to quote from Isaiah 53. And he quotes, this is verse 23. He was maligned, speaking about Jesus, right? So you're going to be like Jesus now. You might, be, you might suffer unjustly, but don't snap back. Don't respond negatively with vengeance. Peter writes, he was maligned. He did not answer back. When he suffered, he threatened no retaliation, but committed himself to God who judges justly. Okay, can I emphasize that? Jesus, the servant of God, committed himself to God who judges justly. So Jesus is somebody other than God. He committed himself. He trusted in his God. Verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we may cease from sinning and live for righteousness. By his wounds you are healed. For you were going astray like sheep. That's Isaiah 53, 6. But now you have turned back to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Unquote. So here, Peter is describing that like Jesus, who suffered unjustly, he trusted God. He committed himself to God. And that action of Jesus should make people respond by ceasing from sin and turning back, repenting from sin. Jesus' suffering causes others. It triggers others 
to turn from sin, to turn away from it and back to God. But again, the main point here is for Peter, as he's quoting Isaiah 53, he describes Jesus, the servant of God, committing himself to God. Jesus is not God. He committed himself to God. Peter differentiates Jesus from God. He declares that Jesus trusted or committed himself to God. He let God bring in the justice at the proper time. Now, this is the case with all the places where Isaiah chapter 53 is directly quoted or alluded to in the New Testament. The servant of God, Jesus, is somebody other than God himself. So don't come with Isaiah 53 with this, oh, he's the Messiah, it's the Messiah, it's the Messiah. Okay, fine and dandy. But don't use that as a deceptive tool to try and claim that Jesus is literally God. Isaiah 53 does not say that. And the New Testament passages that allude to or quote Isaiah 53 show that the servant of God, Jesus, is distinguished from God. So now that we can see that the servant of God is not God, then we can ask the question, who is this servant that is being discussed in Isaiah 53 and in other chapters in Isaiah and before we talk about one of the main candidates, and obviously Israel, note that the prophet Isaiah himself is called by God, my servant. In Isaiah chapter 20, verse 3, quote, Just as my servant Isaiah has become a sign to the people of Egypt and Ethiopia. Right? Isaiah was a sign for the Gentiles, for the nations. And I think that in many cases, in Isaiah chapter 42 to 66, Isaiah himself can be qualified, can be understood to be the servant of the Lord. For instance, Isaiah chapter 49, there's quite a bit of overlap between Israel and the prophet Isaiah. You can see that, yes, Israel is the servant of yudhav and in a sense, representing Israel, Isaiah, a righteous Israelite, is the servant of God. Look at verse 5. And now, Yahweh says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it's too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. Unquote. Now, the Messianic believers like Dr. Brown say, see, this can't be Israel because it's somebody else who isn't Israel that's restoring Israel to God. Well, also the prophet Isaiah did this. Isaiah is a servant of yudhav within Israel, who is God's servant. And the role of Isaiah, indeed, was to be both a light to Gentiles, but to restore, to bring back the people of Israel as an Israelite himself. In a sense, he's functioning as Israel's righteous representative, a righteous servant that Israel is supposed to be, a remnant of those kinds of people that are God's servants, and Isaiah is one of them. Also in the book of Isaiah, chapter 22, verse 20, Eliakim, who becomes kind of a secretary of state, the chief counsel to the Davidic dynasty, he is called by God, my servant. He's a righteous person that functions and does the things that God wants done. In Isaiah 37, 35, David is called the servant of God. It's in the context of the Assyrian conquest of Judah, where Judah is hanging on, and the righteous king Hezekiah turns to God, and God says, I will defend this city to save it. 
for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. So here's another example of a servant of God in the book of Isaiah. And Moses is also called God's servant in the book of Isaiah, chapter 63, verse 11. They remember the days of old of Moses, his servant, and they're wanting God to work again like he did in Moses' day. So we have many people who are called the servant of God in the book of Isaiah. Now, here's another one that we have to understand that at this time, this person, in the time of Isaiah, this person was a servant of God, and that is the King Hezekiah. In 2 Chronicles 32, 16, this is in the context of the Assyrian messengers mocking Hezekiah, calling him a nitwit, and mocking the Almighty God of Israel. In that context where Hezekiah is despised, he's mocked, the Chronicle records, quote, Sennacherib's servants said still more against the Lord God and against his servant, Hezekiah. So Hezekiah is a servant of God, of the Lord God. He's a righteous person. He's a remnant of the house of David who is doing the will of God, who's obeying God, who's trusting God. Even in the face of opposition, of mockery, he still believes and trusts in the God of Israel. So in the book of Isaiah, there are a number of individual Israelites, all from within Israel, that are a servant or the servant of the Lord. And their commitment serves as an example and a trigger for Israel's restoration, for Israel to come back to God. And of course, the main servant in the book of Isaiah is the people of Israel. You, my servant Israel, Jacob, whom I have chosen, behold, my servant Israel, over and over and over again. God says of Israel, you are my witness. You are my witnesses. Hear, O Jacob, my servant Israel, whom I have chosen. The word chosen is another synonym for the servant. Remember these things, O Jacob, O Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you to be my servant, O Israel. I will not forget you. That's Isaiah 44, 21. So it's very clear that the people or persons of Israel are the servant of God. And they fit this description of Isaiah 53, like the Jewish people say. Is Israel the suffering servant of Isaiah 53? The answer is yes. And they are a prototype for the Messiah, Jesus. Just like Israel suffered and was a witness for the one true God, so is the Messiah, Jesus. He becomes a representative the servant par excellence, if you would, like Isaiah, like Hezekiah, like David, like Moses. In the face of opposition, he takes this despising. People think he is being punished by God, yet it's the sins of the people that have caused the suffering of the servant. This is the key. He takes the mockery, He takes the abuse from people. They caused his suffering, but he doesn't retaliate. He puts his trust in God who judges justly. He puts his trust in God who is able to save him from death. Just like Israel is to do. Now, sometimes you'll hear Dr. Brown, these other messianics say, well, look at Israel is suffering for their sins. They're suffering for their wickedness. They're going into exile. Yes, that's true, but that's only looking at like half of the book of Isaiah. A general format of the book is you're going to have one paragraph where it looks like Israel is just like terrible, they've sinned, this is why you're going into exile. And then the very next paragraph, Israel is beloved by God, they're in the right relationship with God, they're God's witnesses, God loves them, God will never forsake them, never abandon them. He will keep his promises that he made to Israel. 
if you're going to focus only on the discipline and the sin and the reason they're in exile, sure, you can do that. But you can do the other as well. You can focus only on God's continual love for them. God will never forsake them. A mother might forget her nursing child, but God will never forget Israel. Israel is God's witness. Israel is God's testimony to the world, to the Gentiles. Okay, this is the way the book of Isaiah works, back and forth, back and forth. God is saying, you trust me, it's going to be this way. A great example of servants in the book of Isaiah who trusted God, Isaiah and Hezekiah. Look what happened in their days. They trusted in Yudhevave. They committed themselves to Yudhevave in the face of all this opposition. But in the end, God comes through and decimates Israel's enemies, the Assyrians, and they're nothing but dead bodies. The taking abuse from others and still putting your trust in God, being a witness for who God is, God's not going to forget you. You're in the right relationship with God. You're restored. There's a remnant within Israel that are the true servants of God. That's the format of these last chapters of of the book of Isaiah and of other parts of the book of Isaiah. This back and forth where all of a sudden the prophet changes from desperation and destruction to hope and restoration. So Israel is not abandoned. The righteous servant is of Israel, be it a remnant, be it Hezekiah, be it Isaiah. They're all a prototype for the Messiah. This is how Jesus knew he would suffer and then experience glory. He's reading passages like Isaiah 53 to know, to see that his experience will parallel the experience of the people of Israel, taking on abuse from others because he is on the side of God, because he is sent by God, because he's chosen by God, because he is God's servant. That's what's going on here in the book of Isaiah. And that leads me to the third point I wanted to make. We've seen that the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 is not God. We've seen the various candidates for who the suffering servant is. None of those candidates are God. Israel is not God. Isaiah is not God. David is not God. Jesus, as the servant of God, as Peter says, is not God. And that Israel, as God's servant, serves as a prototype for who the Messiah is and what he will be like. But here is another major theme in Isaiah chapter 53, and that is that God's servant, yes, Israel, as a prototype for the Messiah, and yes, indeed, all of God's servants will experience a change of circumstances. The servant in Isaiah 53 goes from being despised despised by humans, not by God. He goes from being despised to being exalted. God's servants, or God's servant, goes from suffering to comfort, joy, exaltation, restoration. Yes, even from death to life. Yes, even the people of Israel experience going from death to life, an exile and return. So again, this is not a depiction of God in Isaiah 53, this suffering and then transitions to comfort and joy. It's that God does this for his servant. Yes, as God's representative, you might say as much as you did it to one of the servants of God, you're really doing it to God. And your opinion of God's servant is really your opinion of God or your rejection of God's servant is a rejection of God or your mocking of God's servant is a mocking of the God of Israel. But it's not literally God himself. So Isaiah is saying, like in some ways, kind of like the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave, Isaiah is saying that God's servants will experience this change of circumstances from suffering to joy, from being despised to being exalted. And in that way, this suffering servant of Isaiah becomes a prototype for all of God's people. We are called to be like this. If you're going to be aligned with the true God, you will be mocked. You will be despised. But commit your way, trust in God, that in the end, 
the circumstances are going to change. And commentators have noted that after Isaiah 53, the plural sense of servants comes out, I think it's like 10 times in the rest of the chapters of the book of Isaiah. All of a sudden, Isaiah is talking about the servants, plural, of Yudevave. Why? Because the example has been given in Isaiah 53 of the servant par excellence, and others are called to be like him. Just like the Apostle Peter did in that passage we looked at earlier, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. Peter calls others in the same way, be ready to be mocked, be ready to be despised, be ready to, if need be, to suffer unjustly, just like Jesus. And, like Peter, Paul, and James all say, these sufferings are a trial for your faith. They prove your faith, that you're trusting God. Commit yourself to God. Just note this transformation of circumstances. You go to Isaiah 54. This is why it's so clear that this is talking about Israel, right? All of a sudden, in the next chapter, sing, O barren one who did not bear. It's talking about Jerusalem. Break forth into singing and crying aloud. You were, you were barren, and now you're going to sing for joy. Okay, this is all about Israel. God is your maker. He's your husband. He's your redeemer. It's all about Israel in the next chapter. In Isaiah 54, 11, O afflict one. Okay, this is talking about Jerusalem and Israel. But perhaps the best chapter to see this restoration or change of circumstances for God's servant and servants is in Isaiah chapter 65. Here is yud heh vav -He, Yahweh, the Lord God, speaking. He says, I will do for my servants' sake. My servants shall dwell there in the land. My chosen shall inherit it. My people, these are synonyms for God's servants, who have sought me. And then in verse 13, therefore thus says the Lord God, behold, my servants shall eat, but you shall be hungry. See the change in circumstances? Behold, my servants shall drink, but you, the ones who were mocking previously, shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but you shall be put to shame. These are always my servants, God's servants. Verse 14, Behold, my servants shall sing for gladness of heart, but you shall cry out for pain of heart. The Lord God will slay you, but his servants he will call by a different name. So we can see the change in circumstances. Isaiah is calling all of us to be like the servant or servants of yud heh vav -He. So, yes, Israel is the servant of God in Isaiah 53. And yes, Israel is a prototype for the Messiah. So, in a sense, they're both the servant of yud heh vav -He, the servant of God. Here's what the New Testament is claiming. Israel is the prototype for the Messiah as the nations treated and despised Israel, or as the nations treated and despised the Lord's servants, Isaiah himself, Hezekiah himself, the New Testament claims that both the nations and the leaders of Israel treated the Messiah, God's servant. The leaders of Israel and the Gentile nations killed the Messiah. They rejected him. But like God restored and brought Israel back to life again, even so, God restored his servant Jesus and raised him from the dead. The history of Israel is a pattern or a prototype for the Messiah himself. And we as well are called to be like the servant. We're called to be the servants of God. Put up with the suffering, put up with the mockery, put up with the despising by others, put up with the slander. We know who the true God is. The one God is the Father, and Jesus is his servant. So there's a change in circumstances. Israel is the prototype. So is Isaiah. So was Hezekiah. They're examples for us. They were examples for Jesus. He could look back and see, oh yeah, was it not written? that the Messiah should suffer and then enter into his glory. The servant 
of God is not God, but commits himself to God, who is able to save him from death. Yishma'u wa'navim v'yismachu. The humble will hear and rejoice.